Welcome to Open Your Reality, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chad. Today, we have a very interesting guest on. His name is Tom Althaus, and he is a screenwriter. He wrote a screenplay called The Immortals, which he claims was very similar to the Matrix movie. And you know, The Matrix is my favorite movie, and we're going to find out today all about it. I think you're going to find this man and this whole story to be extremely interesting. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me on, Chad. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. I saw a few of your past interviews, and you were brought to my attention by a viewer. Now, this is the, the main story here is that you wrote this movie called The Immortals, which you believe is very similar to the Matrix movies. What year did you write The Immortals? It was actually started in 1989, and then it was completed in 1993. And so then it was actually pitched in 1993. I have the actual uh, submission letters and everything right here. And uh, yeah, and testimonies from the submitting attorney um, per request of Warner Brothers and also uh, the gentleman who worked with me on the fight scenes. So that was well before the Matrix movie came out in 99. Sorry. Okay. I, yeah, I actually have the original script right here, copyrighted from the copyright office with the supervisor director of the copyright office, which precedes the Matrix, the one that was used on set and we know that because the fight choreographer, one of the fight choreographers from Matrix has clued me in that that was used on set with the storyboard they came up with. So you, you wrote this script. What, was it ever made into a movie, The Immortals? I know it was supposed to be The Matrix, but I mean, did, did you create a movie out of it or did you, what happened with the screenplay? I submitted it to Warner Brothers per the request after Bonaventura had me pitch it to him up in New York. And so what's interesting is I was waiting for that to uh, turn into what he promised the movie being made. And uh, what happened was when they made The Matrix, they actually claim they have used up the story. You'll see the Joel Silver even say that in interviews on set in 2003, when they do the second and third installment of Matrix. And what they say is, you know, well, we hope we used up the rest of the story. Let me just hold this up real quick, just so we get a foundation. Okay. This is the original screenplay. And what you have here is you see all these tabs that's all iconic scenes that are original in this work. And you can tell it's original. Well, the Immortals title, director and copyright specialist. And look at the date, 1998. Yeah, so this precedes yeah. Matrix. This is what was used on set. Now what the Wachowskis did was they made it up as they went along with this in hand and their 600 page storyboard that people who follow the story would understand that that was used also. And they just took every iconic image that was in here, including tech, and they drew it out, simplified it, lifted it into the storyboard. This is why they had a 20 foot rule with your with 20 feet of the Wachowskis, you're fired. You're not supposed to see this work. 20 feet, 20 feet wouldn't give you a very good view. And so in here is everything from train stations, squiddies, Jack's the neck, red pill, blue pill, little girl, pointing to the sun, everything is here. Zion, underground, squiddies, you name it, it's all here. So as far as being similar, that's why I was smiling, is that uh, it's all here. What they simply did was lifted every image they thought was cool. And I sent you some stills from the matrix itself and everything is in here. And if, in fact, let me just cap one more thing and we'll move on. If we go to the train station scene from this original work, this is the 1998 version. Go to the train station scene. You're going to see the, uh, just how this was reverse engineered. What they did was this precedes matrix. This was used on set. They see here the Wachowskis are reading about a train station with a little girl being pushed forward. They see liquid mirrors are the security devices that if you take the red pill, you can pass through those liquid mirrors. So they're going to strip that apart and simplify it. They didn't understand the work, so they simplify it. So lift every image they think is cool. Now, this can't be denied, and I'm told by the copyright office there's no way to deny this. That's why our document team is going so hardcore on all this. So on the second page, you'll see how the actually liquid mirrors actually do reform if some man tries to run through it and doesn't take, hasn't taken the red pill, he's going to be cut in half like an insect in resin. You have the little girl being pushed forward by the uh, mom in a crowd. What they did, Chad, was they cheapened the scenes and got it under budget. So it's supposed to be a crowded scene, not a well-dressed Indian couple. It's supposed to be, yes, families trying to get their children in the program where they can't follow, but they didn't explain why. They just said the little girl was a subplot. So Brittany becomes Sati, and you have this uh, haggard woman pushing forward her little girl among the crowd. Please take her. And what happens is, you know, he has a conversation with the guard. Now, the train station is actually two different scenes in this original work. 
In the second scene, which will sound familiar to audience members, you have Neo trapped between worlds. It is the Trinity character, yes, sent by the Oracle to get him out of that. He, she pulls him through the liquid mirrors because she's still an anomaly in the program. And that's how he passes when he's cut from the program. Now, the Wachowskis don't say anything about this. They don't put anything in there about it. They simplify everything and say, let audiences figure it out for themselves. Well, when we make the original movie the way it is copyrighted, they're saying they're going to put an injunction on us. In fact, Sophia Stewart's calling me all the time saying, you can't do this work. It'll show, it'll be similar. We proceed then. We have the copyright. There's no copyright on Matrix. Yes, Sophia Stewart, we're going to make the work and people will see exactly how it's been done. And she goes, well, it's already been done. It's used up. Nobody will want to come to see it. Do you think, Chad, anybody will want to come see original work and explains how all the different iconic images fit together in an original work and ties together to make the story cohesive and coherent? So how did, how did the um, movies, what's the name of the movie studio that made Matrix? Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers, right. How did, how did they get access to your script? Good question. This man right here, Lorenzo D. Bonaventura, he had me pitch it through his best friend, Lenny Coco. I sent you a picture of Lenny Coco in the chimes. He's one of the top billboard chart famous um, ballad groups. So that was the man that had me uh, pitch it to him. And Bonaventura still claims he shepherded and discovered, shepherded and discovered the Matrix story. And one of the few that understands it, yeah because he had my screenplay in hand and had me pitch it and explain it to him. So but, that's how it went in. Okay. But the, and they, ne they never, they never purchased it from you, of course, right? They just stole it from you. Bonaventura said that if we're making this, it's revolutionary. He gave us the details and how to submit it. And that's exactly what James Boyd of Norfolk did. Mm -hmm. and it's really interesting. Let's just take a peek at that. So what we have right here, I mean, I've got all my stuff. In fact, now the industry is saying it's common knowledge the work was taken, Chad, from me. And they're fans of the work. And they're saying that, you know, now since you outlasted all this and haven't given up, you've won the chess game. Here's James Boyd of Norfolk. It's an affidavit. I can actually send this to you. He explains how he sent the whole work in. Next page. He notarizes it and makes sure it's clear that he did send it. Next page. Here's a submission letter from James Boyd of Norfolk to 4000 Warner Brothers Lane. It is a certified letter, right? And in it, it talks about the script, the storyboard, the music, tracking number, receipt, everything to 4000 Warner Brothers Lane. It is a clown act. There's no way we're going to lose in court. Now, originally... They threw our case. They're providing their own attorney who was a classmate of theirs, a defense attorney, came to me, wanted to represent me. He, had an, he was an ineligible to practice law. Didn't tell us that. So our case was thrown. Yeah. I, I want to get into the case, but I also wanted to ask you, wh where did your inspiration or motivation come to write The Immortals, which you claim is very similar to the Matrix movie? It's exactly basically the matrix with all the iconic images shuffled and ruined and cheapened. That's what it is. Everything, think of it as just lifted and cheapened. The inspiration came because I was at Pat Robertson's organization being groomed to be the face of the Christian coalition. And I caught wind of all his plans and what he was doing with a cabal. And that there was an operating a sex ring that connected with Disney and his organization that traded personnel back and forth. And I have examples of that. And so what happens is I decided to whisper through art, I say, on a piece after everything was taken from me. What, what is, uh, for, for, for those people that don't know, Pat Robertson is the, like the medium. Go ahead. Evangelist that ran for president in 1988. He ran for president in 1988. I was being groomed to be his face of the Christian coalition, which is a powerhouse. He's still alive, right? He's 92 He's now? Still alive. Yes, he is. And just as bitter as ever. <laughs> okay. So, so I'm sorry, go on, continue what you're saying about it. What's interesting is I just want to back up one more thing. Here's Tony Rankin from Maui. He's the man that was sent to me. He's classmates with the Warner Brothers lead attorney, Linda Burrow. And you look at the bottom, not eligible to practice law. That's how he throws our case. If you look up by name in the Matrix case, you'll see, oh, he lost his case. We didn't have a chance. There was no due process whatsoever. I have evidence after evidence how they threw that. And that's going to be a large chunk of the documentary that's being made right now. Did you spend a lot of your own money on attorney fees to fight this? What's interesting about Tony Rankin, he doesn't want this revealed. His, uh, this is his contract. His contract he doesn't want revealed 
because in this contract, he was saying to us before he's going to supply $100,000. This is how they rope you in, classmates of their attorneys, saying he's going to spend all this money. He's going to get your due. I didn't know who he was. And so he comes up with this whole clause, too, that if we didn't see this, he didn't give it to us. He didn't give us our contract until after he threw our case. Then he gives us our contract. And it says that if we drop him in any way for any reason or don't do exactly what he says, then we'll be saddled with all fees. No longer a contingency. He didn't want this revealed because it's illegal. So what happens is you have this a total circus. And let me just show you this right now. A total circus where there's no depositions of them whatsoever. In fact, he says this. Let me just turn to this page right here. One second. He tells us in the course of events that he will not be doing face-to-face -face depositions with the, with the defendants. He will not do it. In fact, he doesn't do any discovery at all. He runs the clock out while I'm shouting and begging over three years for him to do something. But then there's a contract. If I drop him... I'll be saddled with everything. It's illegal, but Warner Brothers and him are working together to make sure it happens. He also demands that we don't claim Matrix 1. Sophia Stewart gives me a call. It's going to be the mother of the Matrix? No, in-house at Warner Brothers from USC. What she does is says, you can't claim Matrix 1. You can only claim 2 and 3. I'm Matrix 1. You're the missing link, 2 and 3. That's right away. She does that. Then we find she's working for Rankin for Linda Burroughs also. So what happens is by saying I can't claim Matrix 1, they say that the court's going to rule that since you don't claim Matrix 1, any similarities in 2 and 3 don't count. Therefore, there's no similarities. Are you serious? Jack's the neck, train station scene, little girl, Squiddy's at the end. It is the Matrix story, badly replicated on set as they made it up as they went along, sticking in what they're familiar with, Alice in Wonderland. The red pill, blue pill offered like this, eat me, drink me. It's actually the red pill chat is only offered. And that's the bad pill made of the blood of the children. The blue pill is the author's eye. The blue pill is the good pill under by underground. But they took the work and made the red pill good. Now everybody says they're red pilled. The red pill was the bad pill based on an immortal program on the blood of the children and growth hormones. The red pill's bad. I know some of my viewers are going to, wonder because we, we haven't read the immortals no. but and you said there's no there's never been a movie made uh with with that exact screenplay that you wrote i know you're saying the matrix but your your movie was a bit different though right i mean it wasn't exactly the matrix our yeah our movie what they did with matrix keep in mind this is what they did they lifted all the images they thought were cool i can open the script to any page there'll be images that are lifted because there's 190 we found including robot-like agents, Jack's the Neck, Red Pill, Blue Pill, Little Girl's Train Station, Zion People, Architect, Facing Off. Did, did, you, did you, you stated like in your screenplay, does it say the architect? What I say is who the architect is in history and he okay. is an architect. And so what they did, they said they didn't want to use that name in history where I laid it out for the public. So they just called him the architect. Yeah, he's an architect. Okay. So you, you, you write this film and when did you discover what year was it? Did you have to wait until the matrix movie came out for you to see that your, uh, your work was plagiarized or did you know when they were making the movie or before they were making the movie? I discovered it when they let me know it. They let me know it. What they did was their attorney came to me at the Statue of Limitations, 2009. It was made in 1999. They don't want Matrix One done, but they want me to come forward. Why? So they can access all the materials, all the working drafts. Why? Because they don't have any. Their attorney's on tape saying they have no working drafts whatsoever for the Matrix. How do you do a blockbuster movie without working drafts? Because mine was used on set. In fact, their attorneys on deposition of mine, deposition, saying, given the fact you wrote The Matrix, strike that. What you have is a circus being done where they bragged about it being taken, and they said, there's nothing I can do about it. I have two murdered sons. One son left. And do it, I, yeah, I feel it. And the thing is that they said that my last son is alive, so I'll behave myself and won't talk on interviews. I want to show you something else. Here's the assassins, copyright office, assassins. Wachowskis are there with Dina Laurentiis. 
Now, De Laurentiis is the Warner Brothers exec that wined and dined the Wachowskis, promising them beautiful women, money, fame, and fortune. Why did he wine and dine them if the Wachowskis had bragged about failing at everything they did? Failed at a painting business, dropped out of school. Their mom said all they did was play video games. So why is the uh, Dean Laurentiis wanting and dining these failed people? And so what happens is they do their audition piece, basically. Assassins. Assassins is the Wachowskis with Dean Laurentiis right there. Paradise Films, Dean Laurentiis. And they fail. Another writer had to be brought in to finish it. In a 1995 article, the Wachowskis say, this is after I submitted they say they failed as writers and would have to pack their bags and leave Hollywood unless they were given the science project, my project. And so what happens is follow this trail. We see there right there, Dean Laurentiis, Paradise Films, the Wachowskis, Under Assassins. And there's a body of work there. Now what I want to show you is very important. Here is Paradise Films again, Dean Laurentiis, and he's out of this company. Dean Laurentiis Productions and, or, you know, the film company and an investment firm, all claiming they created the work. Now, is it Assassins? No. It's The Immortals. It's my screenplay. But there's no body of work. They're creating a slot at the copyright office, Chad. And look at all those subtitles. All those subtitles there mean that those slots are there. The Wachowskis were supposed to take one of those names when they were given the work. They didn't. They were angry about another writer being brought in to do Assassins. So they didn't take the name. They took the Immortals letters. Here's my screenplay one more time. They take the Immortals letters. They shuffle them around. And they get an anagram. They get Immortals. That's just the letters shuffled around with an X on it. Just like they take Britney and make it Sati. Why they make Thomas A. Neo. And there's more to that in the inserts that I'll get to in a second. Let's follow the copyright trail. I know my work. I know my business. Here is my title, The Immortals, my name. Now, what's interesting is when I submitted the work, see that, that, that thing I showed you with the affidavit from James Boyd, the submitting attorney, that it was published when it was mailed. The certified mail is protected at that point. So I go ahead and cover with the Copyright Office then at this point. Now, watch the copyright trail on The Immortals. This makes them very nervous. Nervous, so Dean Laurentiis takes his name off of it right, right at the same time. Right after I do that, he takes his name off. Now it's just these bogus companies. And look at the reduction on titles. Just a couple titles. 13 now from 197 or so. Now watch what happens. I show up in Hollywood at this time. I talk to Diane Bellis and say, the head of the story department, that I'm going to resubmit to her because we've worked the battle sequences, my friend Greg and I. And what's interesting here is, here's Greg's testimony. I'll get back to the copyright trail in a second. Stay with me. Greg's testimony, available to anyone, where he worked for the Hallmark Channel, and he has the floppy disks from it all being done in 1993. The strategy of Warner Brothers is that there was no working drafts until 1996 because there was no Matrix title until 1996 because they didn't pick one of the titles given. Now, what happens is when I'm out there, and I submit to Diane Bellis again. We have not Dean Laurentiis going back on The Immortals, but we've got all those subtitles again. Now we got all those subtitles again there. No body of work. And the biggest investment firms in the world are claiming they created my piece now. Not Dean Laurentiis. He's running for the hills on it. So now the investment firms claim they created it. Investment firms don't create intellectual property. They profit off it by lending it out and lending money. So what we have here is a situation explained to me from inside Hollywood, which is now working with me on this. We now see all coming true. These investment firms can claim the work because anybody they give it to, they can claim one of these titles. Any studio can claim a title, get a slot at the copyright office under the Immortals with its subtitle working title. Then they make money by giving it out. They also, the studios feel free to steal it. Anybody has a version of it because it's owned by the investment firms. So yeah. situation, yeah, go ahead. Is this, is this a, something common with? Never done. Never done. My work is estimated at $1.2 billion in worth. We have their attorneys on tape, or actually their main guy who's, um, uh, what is it, what do they say, endorsed by them, saying on tape that, yeah, they, they screwed you. You're worth so much money. Um, they have your back against the wall, your attorney in their pocket. So 
they brag about taking the work and what they're getting away with. And you think I'm pissed? Yes, I am. I've got the original screenplay. And even their own attorney said, yeah, they made it up off your work. We've got the guy who I pitched it to, Lenny Coco, on tape saying, yes, you were here. Yes, you did. Yes, you pitched it. It's on tape. It's going in the documentary, Chad. We've got them coming and then going. The only thing they got is they bought time by destroying my life and my son's life, my last surviving son's life. And this is a picture of my two boys when they were little before they were murdered, Sean and Kirk. Oh, now, well, very deep, very deep, because what happens is you have Spielberg very much involved in this whole thing. He's profit off of Disney and the rest of them, too. So in Spielberg, what he's done is in Minority Report, Philip K. Dick's novel, Minority Report. Yeah. Now, he died, I think, around 1982, circa 1982. And he had a rule that he had, basically, that you don't change his work. You don't bastardize his work. He doesn't want it changed up. So they did a book making an apology, basically. Warner Brothers and them saying that, or Spielberg's group, saying that they think Philip K. Dick would be pleased with what they did with Minority Report. What did he do with Minority Report? He changed it all around. And what he did was criminal. Minority Report is about pre-crime. Tom Cruise plays the character. Who's the character he's playing? John Anderson, Captain John Anderton. My dad's name is John. My dad's name rank in the Navy was Captain now, that is not in Philip K. Dick's novel. Captain is not the rank. Tom Cruise's character is a commander or something like that, a commissioner or something. Not a captain, but Spielberg can't resist. So he puts Captain John Anderton, my dad's name, my dad's rank, Tom Cruise's character. And what does Philip K. Dick no novel have? What does he have in his novel that he doesn't want altered? There is nothing about a child being murdered. But what does Spielberg do against his wishes and mine? For his pre-crime, I give you Spielberg. Spielberg puts in Sean is murdered. Sean has murdered the son of Captain John Anderton. My dad's name, my dad's rank, my son Sean is put in a pre-crime film in 2002. And you bet I'm pissed because Spielberg puts that there as a pre-crime. Because Sean is murdered after the movie, and I am hauled off just like Tom Cruise to be put in criminal stasis, basically. Criminal asylum. Uh, and, and crazy house. Because they said, my son Sean was murdered. Obviously, I'm going to commit murder. A 302 is enacted on me. Perfect pre-crime by Spielberg. Now, this gets one more thing. Let me just add one more thing. Spielberg does Saving Private Ryan. So, in the fictitious account of Saving Private Ryan, the characters aren't real. They're based on a true story in a sense, kind of. But Spielberg makes it up. So who does he choose for the names of the sons that are murdered? Take a wild guess. John and Daniel. Now that sounds innocuous at first. I give you Sean and Kirk Daniel, my two sons that were murdered. Thank you, Mr. Spielberg. He rubs it home and they don't stop. In the good place by Universal Studios, where my script went to also besides Warner Brothers. In The Good Place, you have Michael and Sean. Michael is the man who is an imposter, pretending to be in heaven, basically, running it, running the show, under the orders of Sean. Sean, Michael, the two bad ones in the afterlife. A very bad joke, as explained to me from inside Hollywood. But that's not all. In that scene where Michael, the architect, the architect, with a train station that you can only access going in and out of the program, which is exactly what my screenplay has, the train station where you can only in access in and out with liquid mirrors as a security device. Well, you've got Sean, Michael, explaining to the lead character what's going to happen to her. And she gives her birthday, October 14th. 1982, she says. I give you Sean Michael, born October 14th, 1982. The game is over. It's not going to last. Yes, you don't know about me in the news. Yes, I am blocked from the news. Yes, all you do when you Google is see that he lost his case. We haven't even had our case yet. And it's on fraud. There's no statute of limitations. First, what we do, documentary. Next, what we do, 
make the film as is. You will see this exactly as it is. Now I sent you stills with exact script pages I can turn to right here, like I showed the train station. And all that is from this predating matrix used on set as I'm being told by their own teams. And in there, you see how it lines up perfectly and how they're lifted. So what we have now is we can not lose. In fact, Warner Brothers contacts and Disney contacts are saying on tape, I'm not stupid. I taped them for the documentary. And they're saying, you've won the chess game, Tom. You've won the chess game. And they're afraid of your power. The ones they work for are afraid of your power. They say now, if you're smart enough, right, rough enough to write the Matrix story, you're smart enough to follow the trail. You bet your butt I am. And I've got all the proof needed right down the line. And I'm not going to stop. There's children's lives at stake, not just my son. But what they do is they run a corporate situation where they'll destroy the lives of authors. It is de decided by Disney, Mike Lang of Disney, and it gets much juicier than this. Mike Lang of Disney is Harvey Weinstein's boss. He was put in place in 1993 after my material went to Disney and Warner Brothers. So he's the executive in charge of acquisition of intellectual property. How to get scripts they don't own called the Disney Library in a New Jersey warehouse. Look at the Vanity Fair article I can send you. And his strategy was employed that you wait for the author's death or you implement the author's death and then you simply absorb it through the court of your choice, their work. And you bastardize it any way you want, like Philip K. Dix was done. I know what I'm talking about. I know how to win this and I will win this. And now they're panicking. They're panicking because the whole cabal is involved. And that's what's happening. If you look at uh, anything here, anything from, look at this comment by the Wachowskis. Tell me if you don't see panic forming. They say that every cell that went in the matrix, every piece of information, because everything's supposed to go through the clearance department, right? So what they do is they cannot have names that match people on the outside. They cannot have birthdays or things that match the authors. So they say that every cell that went into the matrix was by Larry and Andy only. And that's their testimony under testimony. Now, here's a testimony also that reverts on that. In this testimony, they say that it was their production department and their art department that put my stuff in. Now, when I say my stuff in the matrix, please, anybody watching your interview, go to the matrix films, freeze frame the interrogation scene. Now, when Smith opens that green filter, folder, freeze it. It'll be hard to freeze, but freeze it for that split second it's open. The page is still turning in the graphic. And you're going to see this. And I kid you not, take a look for yourself. Test me. What you're going to see, here's my diploma, my high school diploma. Central West High is Neo's school. You're also going to see Thomas A. as Neo. Anderson is my Scottish clan name. You're going to see a banner of July 22nd on that rap sheet on Neo. July 22nd was what my birthday was in 1996 to 99 records. That's what USA Insurance told me about. Also, they correct it in 2003 when they do Animatrix. In Animatrix, I'm going to show you a screenshot right now from Animatrix. My exact birthday from the Wachowskis, Curtius Wachowskis, Wachowskis, 7, 2, 59, 1 before the 60, 2, 7, black hands. I was born July 2nd, 59. The red hand is four past the four. I was 44 in 2003 when this graphic was made. That's my exact birthday and age on the clock. There is no way in hell or heaven they're going to get away with this. That is my birthday. The clock hands are usually set at 10 after 10. Look at Dexter to any kind of film preceding 1993. 10 after 10 is the industry standard, just like 555 on phone numbers. I kid you not. So now the industry standard in Man in the High Castle, Walking Dead, you name it. Thanks to Wachowski's is 7-2. 7 Because it's safer to use my birthday, my exact birthday, than it is 10 after 10. So in Animatrix also, you have Tom Park Althouse across the screen. My exact name from the Wachowski's. Right across the screen. Now people say this. I, I've been a little frustrated with a lot of people in the public because they go, why would they do that? Why would you ask that question? If I'm the author and I have the copyright right here, and here it is, I'm the author. Do you not think they're going to use their films to mock the author if they got away stealing the work? Do you not think they're going to put it in his birthday if they can get away with it? 
The only reason I saw this material, Chad, is because someone from the story department at Warner Brothers called me and told me they're sick of what's going on and relayed everything to me where to look. And it gets better and better and better. And one hell of a documentary is coming everybody's way. And wait, you see it. And I'm doing this for my last son's life. And I'm doing it for other children out there that have been abused. And I'm going to finish the work, Chad. So when people come at me that are shills and try to say, oh, it's garbage or whatever they want to say, they're not going to stop me. I know what I'm doing. And I've got Hollywood telling me I've already won. So do you think I'm going to stop? No, not at all. Well, there's obviously a lot to unpack there. I wanted to ask you one question that came to mind a while ago. Sure. <clears throat> um, have you ever had any contact with the, with the Wachowskis or have you, did you know them? They sent me feeds um, where it was through like a court thing where they only sent like this stuff here where I, I show you their testimony. Because this is something I'm going to show you right now to back that, to go with that. We just raised an important question. And I'm not trying to dodge it. I just want to address this and bring me back to the question you have because it's important tied in. They're saying their production department and art department are the ones that did the graphics. Well, in that graphic, that first graphic, that's the first graphic they shot, interrogation scene. The first scene I wrote was interrogation scene. Thomas A. Anderson, John Anderson, July 22nd, Central West High, Junior High. And then TA 4099 in the column. Now get this. In that graphic, you have Michelle McGay, the art director, listed as Neo's mom. Owen Patterson, the production manager, listed as the other school. So the Wachowskis are blaming Michelle McGay, the art director, listed as Neo's mom. Owen Patterson, the other school, the production manager, as the one that's put it there. When they said every cell is between, only between them and, and Larry and Andy putting it in. So... That's what the point I want to establish is they're blaming their own people now. Change sworn testimony, blame them. And it's like my stuff is inserted over and over again. Then you have Joel Silver at the end saying, we hope we used up the rest of the story. You got Sophia Stewart saying they've already used your story up, that no one's going to come and see it. But back to your question. But I mean, have you ever spoken with them? Have you ever... Not personally, and I hope I never have to. I have made offers to go on air, of course, and they'll say nobody. There is a huge article in TMZ trashing me completely. Tom Althaus, you're just a hack. You know, we didn't jack the matrix, all this kind of stuff. So they did that with TMZ is actually owned, or um, the attorney for TMZ is actually the attorney that represented us against us in Warner Brothers, who had the pocketed attorney. So it's like she also had TMZ, so she used it as a tool. If you call TMZ, it says, welcome to Warner Brothers, basically. So, no, what they did was they, but I'm offering to go on the air and talk about the original work, Immortals and Matrix. Let's talk about where all these scenes come from. Train station scene, you'll agree, is in the Matrix. Red pill, blue pill, you'll agree, is in the Matrix. Little girl at the train station is in the Matrix. Little girl pointing the sun is in the Matrix. You've got the um, red pill, blue pill, uh, Jack's the neck, Zion, the squiddies, identical figures at the end, pulse wave coming out, turning earth green. Let's talk about it. It's all on my screenplay and pre-dating matrix. Your, sc your screenplay says Zion in it? No, mine says, what I had was when I pitched it, I said Zion. Mine mm -hmm. says Wintergreen. I changed it, updated it to Wintergreen. But when I pitched it, I said I had Zion because of what event that happened to me that caused me to want to write the piece. And so Zion is Wintergreen, the city underground. What, what, what inspired you to write The Immortals? When I heard what was going at Pat Robertson's organization, when I lost everything, my family lost everything. And uh, that's when I whispered through art, I decided I've got to bring this forward. I've got to talk about what's going on. So I decided also to take a risk. I would do something never seen before in Hollywood. I put Christ in at the end. And that was something I wanted to do, which fit if I was at Pat Robertson's organization. So what they did I sent you a, a, a still from the show where they have the cross on Neo's thing, like doing the Christ cross at the end. They put Neo to replace the Christ figure in mine, but it doesn't make any sense. It unravels the story. In the Matrix earlier installments, it says Neo can't die, but they had to replace the Christ figure in the end as they made up one long. They actually said, and you can check it out on articles, they said they, that everybody on set, everybody on set said to blow up the matrix. Instead, they kept my exact ending. My ending doesn't work if you take the relationships out. In mine, you have to have Neo with a relationship with his daughter that the little girl from the train station reminds him of. They took that relationship out. At the end, they kept the same sequence. You have the uh, identical figures facing off. They replaced the Christ figure with Neo. 
Now, the reason the Christ figure is important in the end, historically, it's the best figure to balance the equation, including the architect is the best figure to balance the equation. They just left the oracle and the architect babbling at the end as if there's this tentative piece, but they don't explain what's going on. In mine, the architect has a great need, a great need, and they put it in Squid Games. What you have is this. The architect's mind will atrophy from lack of stimulation if he's in a program that's immortal. So he needs stimulation. That's why he has the agent stirring up trouble. Do we have free will? Yes. But the architect thinks he knows every move we're going to make because of cause and effect. They put that in too. That's in my work. So what happens is the architect needs the untainted people of Zion, not six generations, one generation. And now the Wachowski say on their page that, yeah, their fans were right. Thanks for telling us it should have been not six, but one. Yeah, the, the author showed you that, dudes. So what happens is the one generation is there, untainted humanity, to see the architect come back as Christ and purge his agents. Sounds familiar? So what happens is they are brought out by an ambiguous oracle to see him come back as Christ. So his mind will always be stimulated because we're supposed to give our free will over in Judeo-Christian society and beliefs to the architect, I mean, to the Christ, both at this point. And so he's completing the scriptures, if you will, by filling in that role. All he needs is stimulation at that point, doesn't need the agents anymore. And that's what people are conditioned to do. So the untainted people are one generation or one, one formulation out of Zion brought out by an ambiguous oracle to see him come back as Christ, but the real one shows up. And that's the identical figures at the end. That's why they put Neo with a cross. Start to make sense? So they ripped out all the reasoning and all the, but they kept the exact ending. They shouldn't have kept the exact ending. They should have blown it up like everybody said. They say everybody said blow it up. They should have. Now, when you see the original film that I just held up, the screenplay, yes, it's going to be made. And you'll see how it all ties together then. But in the meantime, I have email after email, uh, message after message on my phone from Cypher Man, from Marvel Comics, from um, Paul Anderson. So Marvel Comics and Cypher Man, they're saying, let's do a blend of the Immortals and Cypher Man. Why would I do a blend? And I've got the emails and I got the texts. So why is Marvel Comics trying to reach out to me to do a blend? Because they don't want the original work shown. They don't want you to see how it all ties together. And they know this, you know, sans Sophia Stewart's threat that no one's going to want to see it not happening and that an injunction is going to be placed if it's made. Go ahead, I said, because if there's an injunction placed on this, that means there's similarities, right? We win. So make the film is the solution. Documentary first, educate the public, make the film, and we cannot lose. Because they put an injunction on us, we win. If they let us make it, we win. There's no way to lose. So, so what, when, is, when is this documentary you're making coming out? I just talked to the team last night, one of the head of the teams, and they said, um, we're not supposed to talk about when it's going to come out because the other side, the cabal, prides itself on knowing everything. That's how they held their constituency together. They tell them they know everything, what's going to happen, and everybody, wherever. like the architect. So we don't tell them. We don't let it be known. It's going to be ready soon, but we're not going to tell anybody when it's coming out because we don't want the cabal to know. So is it happening? Yes. Are they doing a good job? Uh-huh. And we got a dedicated team that's amazing. And we got just, it's a field of gold nuggets. So they say, like even Sophia Stewart tried to say this, you got a convolute, it's too much, too much information, it's too many facts. How can you have too many facts, Chad? How can you have too much information if you're a writer, first of all? And if you're making a documentary, how can you have too many facts? So we turn it around and say this, it is a field of gold nuggets that we can choose from. They are just bombs after bombs. Just think of those inserts in the matrix and the first scene they shot and the things they said under sworn testimony, my high school, my dad's name, my birthday, my what, what, what are the chances? We're actually getting a mathematician to do the probabilities for the public to show them how, what the probability is of having all that in there, including uh, the thing I just showed you, the corrected birthday in 2003. Yeah, I, I heard you say in a previous interview, it's like winning the lottery multiple times. That's it is. <laughs> I mean, do you agree? It's like, what is the chance? Like, picture this, Chad, your birthday exactly and your age on a four-handed clock what in the world so what is your birthday may i ask it's it's uh february 3rd 73 okay put that on the clock put that on the clock and your age put that on the clock as numerically indicated what's the chances chad of that being on there 
in the blockbuster film that you wrote and have the copyright to and submitted? What are the chances? It, probably one in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Or trillions. Mm -hmm. oh, let me ask you then, you, <laughs> there's so many questions that I could ask because- Ask anything you want, I'll address it. That's the thing, I'm the writer. I know my baby. They okay. So is that what you're doing now? Are you, are, we, are you a screenwriter now? I have 15 more screenplays. I have a tape of Disney's contact attorney, Disney contact attorney, who's telling me, how do we know you have, and listen to this dialogue, listen to this, what's on the tape. How do we know you have other screenplays? How do we know you have other work? I said, what have you been doing? What do you think I've been doing since 93? They go, okay, well, how do we know you're not a two hit wonder? Now they're saying two hit wonder, Chad, because I have a, a piece called The Domestics green lighted for off Broadway. It's a, a period piece that's been done and performed in, yeah, many times. So they're asking that. I say, of course I've done it. And they go, okay, we have to see those. And I said, no, you're not seeing them. If anything happens to my last son, they're destroyed. They say, you can't do that. This is on tape. You can't do that. I said, if anything happens to my son, they're gone. I'm not going to show you them. Of course, I've made these other things and they're better than the Matrix. So there was all these negotiations, including Bob Iger. Bob Iger got fired after he had his main guy talking to me and I have that phone call taped. 20 minute call where Bob Iger's main office guy is talking on the line and he's saying that, yeah, Bob Iger's going to call you tomorrow. He got fired the next day. Because I did an interview talking about the sex rings connected from Robertson's group, like I said, with Disney's group and how they exchange personnel. And that I said, Bob Iger would be giving me a call. I got fired the next day. So, I mean, that's on tape. That's published record. It's like there's no way in hell or heaven they're going to get away with this, Chad. And I know that. So I'll go through the storm of chills and plants and negative comments and things like that. But we'll make it through. We'll make it through. So for those people who are unaware, I think a lot of people in today's age are aware that Hollywood is not all it's cracked up to be. Is it really like what people say? I mean, it's... Oh my God, I almost choked. I didn't want to me choke. Um, sorry. Yeah. God help us. Hollywood. Maybe that was a naive statement, but I mean, you see like many celebrities, rappers, musicians saying that they sold their soul to the devil yeah, to yeah, be yeah. in that industry. Right, right. Hollywood is basically under the auspices and controls of the FBI and the CIA. Now, they justify that by saying, I know all this because I have dialogue with these guys all the time. That, And keep in mind that I was given the card by the FBI, please extend every courtesy to Tom Althaus. I'll be showing that in the documentary too. So anyway, look, think of this way. The FBI and the CIA, back with Disney, back in World War II, they wanted to control content and still do. They claim that it's for national security reasons, that they control content, Right. And, and one of the fun things about this that you just raised, keep in mind, this piece right here, you know how Terminal List is out right now? The number one show, Terminal List, is on Amazon and everything else, right? Terminal List. They're just having a heyday right now, but they're also giving what's called clues in the industry that I am the rising star now, according to them. I don't have an ego about it. But the main character in Terminal List is Jim Reese. Let's just look at this right here. Look at this right here. The main character in my piece, let me see if I can line this up. I'm going to put my finger on it so I can line it up. I saw Jim Reese. Yeah. Jim Reese. So what is Jim Reese in my movie? A lower echelon CIA department head. Do you think that raises eyebrows in the CIA and FBI and they got to cleanse this work and own it? They control content in Hollywood. So that's the reason also this work was taken, given to the Wachowskis who failed as writers in Hollywood. Right. And in fact, the audition piece, and I'll get back to your question. I'll definitely come back to it and bring me back if I don't get back to it on this, I think in layers. So here we go. What's interesting is the audition piece that the Wachowski said Joel Silver gave them, Joel Silver being the producer who also claims the franchise of Matrix was Bound. In Bound, the main character's name is Violet. Violet is my grandmother's name, my paternal grandmother's name. And what's interesting is that they, that's one Larry says he's identified with. But that was the audition piece to see if they could at least direct, go back to the 1995 article where the Wachowski said, we failed as writers, we had to leave, pack our bags and leave. They also had said in another interview, the guy said, what's next for you? They said, well, we have Plastic Man and Carnivore. And then it says on the transcript, pause. 
we hope to be given the science project. <sighs> Plastic man and carnivore have never been done yet. Their actual work has never been done yet. In fact, when they got the humanitarian award, which they don't deserve off my work, I'm very upset about that. They actually get up to the podium. Larry, Larry gets up there as a woman transformed and starts going like, after they say the genius that created the matrix and brought you speed racer. And I'm like, wow, how'd that fit in there with that? He gets up there and goes like this. How come nobody ever talks about bound? He's pissed because the only work he really did was bound. That's it. Everything else is off the screenplay. And he's pissed at me. That's the answer to why these inserts went in. He was pissed that they had other writers come in for assassins, right? And Joseph had to shuffle a audition piece to prove they could direct the suits. And in fact, when they had a session, it's an article about in 1995 also, the suits are in an, uh, featured in an article where they go like, you know, we know we have something cool. We don't understand it. Yeah, you guys don't understand it. Where Bonaventura says he understands it because I pitch it to him in full. They go, can you explain it to us? Which Aussies couldn't. They couldn't. So Joel Silver steps in and goes, well, there's robots in the program. And Bob, or Bob, I don't know who he is at the time, goes, what do you mean robots in the program? Robots in the program. Well, Joel Silver got it wrong. It's not <laughs> robots in the program, Joel Silver. You got that wrong too, you imbecile. It's actually robot-like agents. And if you have robot-like agents, the stakes are higher. Look at it right here. And if Joel Silver was present, I'd hold it up to his face. Robot like agents, not robots in the program. The stakes are much higher when it's humans that are not allowed to show fear or any emotions. And so when you see the original work that's done the way it's supposed to, everything will make sense. And keep in mind that after the case was thrown in 2014, Chad, what they did was they each had their work ready. Each of the defendants who had their work they wanted to steal from and the Wachowskis, within a week after the case was thrown in 2014, April 2014, what they did was they announced Sense8. But they said it was too big to write down. So they got a million-dollar deal with Netflix, where the attorneys from Warner Brothers went, for no written work. Only my work. After having all my notes, all my script drafts, everything through Discovery when I got nothing from them with an the attorney they had in their pocket, quote. Joel Silver announced Oblivion from Disney, holding it for di from Disney, holding it. And in Oblivion, you have all these matchups that's off the charts in that one, too, with Tom Cruise again. He's the go-to guy to steal his work also to be in it. And so what happens is you've got the situation where Joel Silver is having a novel written, Oblivion novel. When the case is thrown, get this, Chad. He says they're not going to finish the novel. They don't need a plausible source anymore. So they don't even finish the novel. They go right to stealing the work. And then Warner Brothers does Elysium. Elysium. With uh, Matt Damon. Matt Damon, right? And Matt Damon says he wasn't shown a script. He was shown a visual storyboard. See how it comes together? The documentary is going to be the biggest blow away ever. Wait till you see how this all ties together. I've held up the snippets and things like this, but there's no denying the, what we have. It cannot be denied. So they still have shills coming forward and going, he's a BSer. He's full of uh, lies. So look at his, he dyes his hair. Uh, he's, you know, whatever. He talks with a lisp, anything to try to throw people off so they don't pay attention. And it's like, yeah. But yeah, well, your question, your we'll question was Hollywood. Your question was what Hollywood's like. Yeah, like what, like I think people, are, of course, they're interested in your story, but they're also interested to know, like, what is it really like to work in Hollywood, to be behind the scenes? Oh. Like, what are these people like? And I will get to, I want to also get to your children. I also want to get to uh, why they put all these clues in the movies, but that right. might lead right. into the question. But right. go, yeah. go, go Good ahead, Tom. Trail. Good trail. Thanks, Chad. Very cool. Yeah. You're a great host. So really what happens is Hollywood is dirty as mud can be. It is just dirty, dirty, dirty because the FBI and the CIA, I've been saying over and over, the FBI needs to be dismantled. Now, Trump and his group are saying those very words because I know because my sister is handled by the FBI. Brian Fitzpatrick is a lifelong FBI operative from Hollywood, California, Wilkshire Boulevard FBI office. And he is now a Pennsylvania congressman. How do you have an FBI operative is lifelong being a pennsylvania congressman and he handles my sister with every award under the book and so i won't go into all these awards including black tie dinners cnn appearances which is uh owned by warner Bros. by the way so they have all this way of buying off family that's part of mike lang's strategy of disney is to use family members too so that they can then put you away on a 302 they're supposed to say oh he says he's crazy he's going to shoot me and that's all you need, the parameters for putting someone away as a 302, which Tom Cruise's character happens in Minority Report. 
So yes, it's very crooked. When I was with Alan Gear at Will Gear Theater and brought out to be uh, introduced to the Hollywood scene, right? And that's when these uh, entries with the copyright office I held up was happening when they're switching their entries and they had mine and they're switching theirs. That's was the dance was going on that very time I was there. And so she told me it's bad out here, but Tom Hanks and Ron Howard were supposed to be the ones that would sponsor me and I'd be working with them because she said, I'm definitely their type. So what they do is they line you up with people if you're a performer, which you work best with or who they think you'll, they'll like. They have different types. But at the same time, there's a very rampant sex ring operating. A casting couch, yes, of course, is beyond that. There's child sex and everything else going on. And that is considered keeping your actors happy with parties and things like that. That is considered just a business given. In their eyes, a perk. So these seances and things like this and these rituals and everything else, the children are exploited in these. Now, Will, Ellen Gear did not do this, but she revealed to me what was going on. She said, these people are really rotten. They're rough. They're bad. So she was trying to put me in with what she thought was good, Tom Hanks and Ron Howard. Of course, that will raise eyebrows with a lot of people now. I get that. I totally get that. You know, but that's what, the case. what, what about um, Tom Cruise? Is he, is, he, <laughs> is he generally a good guy? What, what's your opinion of him? No. no? Bad guy. Okay. Very bad. Tom Cruise was all A-OK -okay with it on board. They are a group of friends that drink, smoke, do drugs, you name it. And what they do is they will capitalize on the game. The only reason they're in position having what they have is because they agreed ahead of time. If you want to make it in Hollywood, usually you have a contract or something's done or you get your hands dirty. You're involved in sexual activities, things like this. It's called gravy. And so what happens is you're brought in and you're done like that. And you have to make a deal, basically. Now, whether they believe actually in Satan or not, I still have questions about that because the people I talk to that are top or contacts, they say basically it's a game going on because you get your lower echelon to fall in line by pretending you're into Satan and things like that. Do they actually believe that? They are businessmen and businesswomen and attorneys that are trying to make the killer in profit. They're trying to make a fortune by deception and re denying due process. So I don't think they have time for Satan at the top. I think they're using that to hold people and they can use it as a mocking device later for those under. So those under the, that are brought in underneath. Yeah. They're told that this is real and they're taught these events, but I think it's people just playing Halloween. But at the very top, this is run by the CIA and FBI and the government yeah, and, the and, banks, and the banks. Yeah. And the banks. And, and yeah. so what they're doing with these movies is they're trying to use it as kind of a prop propaganda to control the public or lead them into something. I'm so glad you asked that, Chad. That is the cover story. The cover story is that it's supposed to be propaganda or control content for national security. No, that is not the game. It is they can make more than poppy fields and prostitution and gambling and racketeering on an, a single screenplay. Mine is now valued at 1.2 billion. They brag that. And I have to make this four even more. So if you have a single family, you destroy that family, buy out members of that family, destroy their lives, and you made a killing. If that person somehow crawls forward, supply your own attorneys. Deny them due process, and you get access to all their work. There's a reason that they came forward in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 20, 2009, is because 10 year statutes was going to go up. So they bring them forward to you through the attorneys and honeypot wives too mm -hmm. to get your work. And that's what I haven't even touched upon was the honeypot wife and all this. That's why I'm a single dad with Aiden, my last surviving son, who Sophia Stewart and others in the industry are saying doesn't exist now because they're very upset about a film he made, A Father's Journey. So there's this whole thing going on where they're just dancing and it's getting more and more ludicrous. But the documentary will mean they'll just look like idiots because it's all there. Wait, you see all the dots connected. It's, it's beyond a beautiful mind. It's like, <laughs> you mean, guys, get real. My daughter is married to Rios and Associates nephew, the guy, Jacob, um, Jacob Rios, and has never worked a day in his life. He's married to my daughter, estranging her from me. And he came in in 2014 when the case was thrown just before it. And Ralph Rios and Associates was the handout firm, handoff firm who's related to, who was actually Burroughs' classmates and Rankin's classmates from University of Berkeley. All defense attorneys brought in to throw the case. So when you get into this, it's unbelievable. The honeypot wife on my birthday, July 2nd, she's taken back by Mike Lang of Disney, Zia Zion. We got the emails for the documentary. 
We got his emails on my birthday, July 2nd. He's saying, Becca, move in with me for 60 days and shows his bed with a shaving kit on an unfurnished, super expensive in Spokane, Washington, the most expensive property you can find and showing the big L out front with an ego such as massive. We've got them so over a barrel. I wasn't supposed to survive. But what's caused me to live is I got 15 more screenplays and they really want that. So now whoever gets Tom gets to <coughs> excuse me, cleanse the work, cleanse their story out of it. So now it's contract in one hand, dagger in the other. And that's so, what's happening to be in court. So basically the answer that I heard is that it's all about the money. It's all about the money and it's also about power. On that Disney contact tape, one of the tapes, I have an archive. On that tape for the documentary, she says, I said, I, what happens is you get a rapport with these people. If you're smart, make a rapport with your handlers and their handlers. And so you make a rapport, make them think you're their friends. You do. After a while, they start talking to you. I hope when this is over, we can have dinner. I can't wait to meet you personally. And then you start asking questions, Chad, like this. I played it right. It's going to be a hell of a movie. In fact, the attorney said the real life movie is going to be better than The Matrix. Wait till you see what happened. And so in that dialogue, what I say is, so why did they do this to me? And they answered. They answered on tape, the contact. And you know what the answer is? You understand, Tom, it's all about power. You dared to face them down. Now let audiences pick that gem right there. What do you think it means? I dared to face them down. So I'm an author who had this intellectual property. It's proven. I hold the copyright right here. It can't be denied. The copyright office specialist and director says it can't be denied. Bold, it can't be denied. So I dared to face them down because I tried to claim my work or I dared to face them down because I still say my work's there. Terry Belinner is a Broadway director, works with Disney, Lion King, everything else. She was a handler of mine too. She came on exclusive to sponsor me. <laughs> but she said, there's plenty of other stories in you. Don't do Immortals. See the game? See the game. So that's how they do it. So they said, it's all about power. You understand this. They don't understand anything else. It's all about power. I said, what about compassion? They don't understand that. So I started weeding it in there too through handlers. I said, look, your best work comes if you serve an audience. If you have compassion for people, then you'll do your best work. If you're thinking about like the Wachowskis, beautiful women, you know, fame and fortune, then your work's going to suffer because that's going to crowd your mind out, especially them that have uh, the IQ of peace. So, yeah. Well, I'm also curious, you, I asked you about Tom Cruise, but mm -hmm. uh, what about Keanu Reeves? Is he the good guy that everybody... No, he's groomed by them. Think of it this way. Anytime the elite groom somebody, the cabal groom somebody, the Wachowskis were told they had to use Keanu Reeves to save his career. Now, the cabal would not be saving to, uh, his career, Keanu Reeves' career, if he wasn't totally with them, totally doing what they wanted. He's a partier. He hangs out with his biker friends and does drugs and drinks. You know, that's what he does. He's not. Yeah, he's the last pick I picked for the film. He's not the one I chose. But they want to save his career. And so then he profited off it too. Keanu Reeves is one of the worst persons on the planet. And so you see him being groomed where even in SpongeBob, when they announced SpongeBob previews, they show Keanu Reeves poking out of the cartoon with his real face going like, oh, there he is. That's Keanu Reeves getting groomed by the inside. If you're groomed by the inside, you are part of the rotten squad. That is the cabal grooming you. And so he's been a nightmare. Now he did consider coming around because it might look good for him. I have a friend now who came to me who's in the industry that knows him personally and contacted him. He freaked out when he heard the Immortals name title. He freaked out. He knows he's guilty. He was one of the ones that wasn't 20 feet away from my script. He read Jim Reese, his character right there. He knows my story totally up told back. He's afraid to be caught. His whole career was saved because he failed like the Wachowskis. His whole career was saved because he did the Immortals, which became The Matrix. What about Lawrence Fishburne? I don't think Lauren Fishburne knows exactly what's going on. If he does, he's making himself uh, conveniently forget. So I don't have anything bad to say about him, but he needs to wake up and smell the roses. So is, is it common for the movie industry to mock us as a society or an individual like they did with you putting in all these clues in the movies ego, because power ego power ego power yes the currency in hollywood is not really so much money they have these black cards they hand out 
unlimited resources, basically. The bank prints, prints the money, Federal Reserve. What you have is it's clever, being clever. It's almost like the restoration period again, back in the 1600s. It's about being clever. If you're clever, then you're one up in the industry, if you're clever. So the Wachowskis tried to be clever. And the rest of them try to be clever. Spielberg tries to be clever. They just didn't expect anybody telling me it's all there in this particular case. Well, Spielberg has produced a lot of, of course, you know, dozens of movies that people have loved. And, sure. Sure. But, but he himself, you're saying he's, he's, he's not a good guy. He's the Edison of the industry. What he does is he borrows other people's work, borrows other people's work, and claims he made the light bulb. I see. I see. So... How much time have you spent in Hollywood? I mean, have you, you you're in movie sets over there, or you? I was there for years. So okay. Thing, yes, I've done a lot of things. That's why even America's Most Wanted, I did the season premiere. That's what the FBI was such an interest in me when I was being groomed by Robertson's group. So yes, I've done these things. But the thing is, that's why um, Ellen Gear was groomed me to be. When I was at Robertson's organization as a grad student, I was studying script writing. I was getting my master's in screenwriting. So I'm not just Joe Blow breezing by. I know what I'm doing, and I came up with a new way of working it, which I call layered thinking. That's why the Wachowskis and Joel Silver and the Suits never understood the work. You can't understand the work, first of all, from the ripped off version. Like I said, that's just lifted images. That's lifted images where they say, let the audiences figure it out for themselves. So you can put everything in there they throw in, and it won't ever make sense, will it? But if you put it back the way it's in here, yes, it will. Yes, it will. In fact, the Wachowskis, if they had just blown up the Matrix when they were stealing the work, instead of saying we're going to keep it, we're going to keep it as it is, to make the ending, keep the same ending. What same ending? My same ending. Otherwise, why would everybody up on set, Chad, be saying blow up the Matrix? You can hear them saying this. They said that's the quote. That's the quote. So why would everybody on set, everybody, according to them, be saying blow up the Matrix if you have a full script already written? Checked, sealed, delivered, and ready to go with union people on set. Doesn't happen. Why all the code names? Why all the secrecy? You know, why call it the science project? So what you have is a situation where we've got them. We've got them. It has not been a fun ride. I have two dead sons. I have an estranged daughter. My sister is bought completely by an FBI operative who's actually a congressman who destabilized Ukraine. So I is not a fun journey. I do laugh at the ridiculousness of how they are and their mentality. If you go to um, YouTube, search out bound Wachowskis, bound interview Wachowskis, and listen to how they talk. Listen to how they talk. Tell me they could write anything and tell me their ego isn't as massive as Manhattan and tell me they know what they're doing. Was it, there, there was, wasn't there three brothers, there's three brothers and one, one of them became transgender? There's, there's two brothers and they both had to. Andy didn't want to be. Andy was brought in in the end. In fact, Andy didn't appear in Matrix 4 situation because he didn't want to get caught. They know we're coming for the documentary. They're freaking out about it. And so what happens is Larry's too bold. Larry wants to make as much money as possible. He thought make Matrix 4, cash in all the way. And before we come forward, then you used up the rest of the story, as Joel Silver said. Now, Keanu Reeves wasn't going to do it at first. And then he decided to cash in, too. Well, shame on you, Keanu Reeves. You just proved yourself. I mean, do you think it was their decision to become transgender or they, was it maybe? Larry's, or? yes. Larry was all for it. Giddy is a schoolgirl. Andy, no. Andy looks like somebody who belongs in a bar scene. But what happens is Andy didn't want to be a girl. But because they broke the rules and did what? Were they sticking the first graphics? Were they sticking Animatrix? They just kept thumbing the nose of Warner Brothers. I'm holding up my diploma again, Central West High. So since they did all that, to get back at, since the contact told me that was what they were doing, they were mocking me and getting back at Warner Brothers. So since they did that, they had to pay a price. If you thumb your nose at the cabal, what was I told? I dared to face them down? Well. If the Wachowskis dared to face them down when they're in-house already and they're saving their careers, then you've got a price to pay, Andy. Get the dress on. Put the wig on. And what Andy did was just slap a black dress on and slap a wig on. He looks like the James Bond character where that widow uh, with a, a top iron from the fire is fighting James Bond and it looks like a bad version of a lady. No makeup and an old widow. Well, that's what Andy looks like. And he's asked on the air. He's asked. So you must be happy now. And he basically says, no, not really. No, you're not, aren't Andy. No, you're not. You're scared, aren't you? Yeah, you are. 
I would love to do an interview with Andy and Larry and talk about the baby. I would love to get on there and talk about where the scene. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get them on. Let's do it. I would be there in a heartbeat. Do it. And I'd love to have Sophia Stewart show up too. The third eye. Third eye is Jesus and Star Wars bastardized and plagiarized. I mean, there's not one shred of Matrix or Terminator in it at all. Well, Certain pages. So, so I would love to get on with Larry and Andy. Put Andy and Larry on. I'm there. Let's talk about the train station scene. The origins of it. Where does it come from? Let's talk about the little girl there. The little girl represents my daughter that was taken from me. The little girl pointing in the end to her with her daddy, Neo, not with a cross on his chest mocking the Christ figure, but is actually pointing the son saying, you did well, daddy. That is representing, representing the author's daughter restored to him. There's a whole meaning to it. And that's why they say on their fan page, little girl in the story is just a subplot. No, it isn't. It's the heart and soul of the man who wrote it. Yeah. Well, I don't mean this to sound demeaning, but I know that there are going to be people in the audience who might be thinking that maybe you're paranoid, you know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're taking it over the top. You're looking at too much, but uh -huh. I want to get, I want to get, I want to get into the, to, uh, unfortunately I, I'm, uh, my condolences about your children. I appreciate that. Can I just answer one thing though? When they say sure. that, sure, sure. Central West phone seven two fifty nine Zach birthday. Anybody that says I'm paranoid after I lost my sons and everything kept going for everybody, and my intention is to give my copyright to every man, woman, and child when I'm done. There's no ego. There's no paranoia whatsoever. In fact, I think I've shown great courage to see this through, and Hollywood feels the same way. If somebody would say that, well, you're outside the flock. The actual powers to be have applauded the courage, and that's one of the reasons I'm still here. They think it's amazing. They can't wait for the real film, the real life film. So to those, I don't have time for those that say that. That's too small a mind. And I'll say that as the author. But go okay. Ahead. Okay. So uh, how, how do you know that you're, how do you know that the cabal or the movie industry was responsible for the death of your children? Because I'm told they're responsible for the death of my children. They say I know what it means and that my last son is alive. It's on tape. My last son's alive because they know that I'm concerned for his safety. It's right there. It's on tape. Okay. That's what make me not do interviews and to shut up. It was Aiden who told me he's 15 now. He's taking college level credits. He is in soccer, plays the piano. He's an amazing kid. He's the one that told me, Dad, you keep going. You finish this, even if something happens to me, because he knows he's on the mark. He knows his head's on the line. He said, you keep going. You finish this, even if something happens to me. That's the character of my son. And anybody that tries to taunt us and say paranoid, you're coming across a man and his sons and their memory and honoring them. So shame on you. I have nothing good to say about you. Put that forward. Well, what, now, you said your daughter is estranged from you? Yeah. She's does it have something, does her, it have something to, do, to do with all this? Yes, yes. She was basically given sessions with Pat Robertson's group when this all started. When the screenplay was coming forward, I pitched that session in 1993. That's when Robertson actually had a hold of it too. And so what happens is my children were sent through these sessions where they had to believe their dad was narcissistic, evil, paranoid, dangerous, going to shoot somebody with a gun. That's what they had sessions with. So they had to be taught at young ages that their dad was evil and bad. In fact, my brother, who works with Spielberg's group at Disney, he taught his kids that I'm, quote, worse than Satan himself. So how long were you in this, in this group with Pat Ro Robertson? I was there from 1987 to 1988. That's and when he ran for president. He ran for president in 1988. What, what, in, what inspired you to be part of it? I was coming from a very religious family. And I was basically told where I should go. It was very, you know, strict. And so, like I said, my dad was captain in the Navy. And so I had to go there. So I went there and the idea was it'll be a Christian place, a good place to study. It'll have values. That was just the opposite. Just the opposite. I got moved fast tracked up to the ranks and told that I was picked out of network and student body. And so I was exposed to everything, including the sex ring. It always seems to be a sex ring involved in all these higher ups. <laughs> it's a way to control your group. Look at Jerry Falwell, what happened with his pool boy. He, he says that you know, the guy had sex with his wife and he watched. No, he didn't. He was involved in that too. It's a homosexual sex ring. What happens is they employ you and give you position. Then they spring on you that you're part of a sex ring now. 
If you want those rewards and positions, you have to perform. Hollywood does the very same thing. It's a control measure in order to control your people. Yeah. Um, have you ever heard of um, uh, an, an actress named Tio Tequila? No. Okay. She had a, a, she was popular maybe 10, 12 years ago and she had a TV show on MTV and, uh, but she's very outspoken about the industry and about, you know, how they compromised her sexually and everything like that. And she's kind of out of it now. So um, you do, you do hear people stepping forward. I've seen many celebrity interviews where people step forward and talked about it, right. but like the people that get to the top, I was watching an interview yesterday with Madonna a recent interview she was on a talk show and uh i think it was jimmy kimmel but it, these people that have been they have this longevity in the business is that because they're just playing by the rules this whole time they either are taught to look the other way informed to which i was told the same thing when they said there's plenty of stories in you don't go after mortals they're trying to condition you not to get involved just be the good soldier so what happens is they will tell you these things. So they're well informed of what's going on. They know, but they're not going to tell on it unless something propels them to, you know, that they actually feel they have to come forward. But they're not going to throw their careers away. They're not, but they're well informed. They know what's going on. No one's, no one's naive to what's happening in Hollywood when you're in Hollywood, especially long term. Ellen Gear knew. Yeah. Well, we know, we know what happens with actors, actresses, possibly directors, producers, but what about the screenwriters? Are, right. are, they, are they in that too? Or yeah, is it- we're, we're courted. We're courted. In fact, recently I had a um, contact, I taped it again, that said that I would be set up very well, flown out to resort for 10, for, I could bring 10 people with me, air flights, resort, everything. They were going to groom me to be a script doctor. They said, you'll never have credit for your work, but you'll be one of the richest people in Hollywood. See, script doctors is part of the back door for those of that have been uh, had the courage to keep standing. So that's one of the offers that's been on the table is to be a script doctor where I steal other people's work. See, help steal it and then help other writers write. So see the game, see the game. The carrot is always dangling. It's always there if you want to grab it or do you want to be a failure and try to help the public? And you're right. You alluded to something earlier where it was about the public being looked down upon and they do. Spielberg especially looks at the public as idiots. Dumb. They're in their film portraying that. Just zombies. Just like, you know, so, can, so, so anyone can break into the film business? Like a- selected, if you're chosen. If you're chosen. And that's a calling card. You know, it's like that's how they work it. Now, a lot of times if you're desirable, um, Liberty University has a sex ring that's operating from Robertson's group. They have the personnel. They transfer the personnel down there. Look at what happened to Jerry Falwell or wherever his name. Yeah. So what happens is you've got the situation where uh, they're there. And I just had a girl call me the other day that's working in the industry and said that she was propositioned by one of the Liberty University uh, guys that said, you know, you can play my wife in a film and you can, you know, how tall are you? They use it as a hit mechanism and they always have that casting couch mentality where they can get the person in, like, here's the, here's the goods, but you got to perform if you want them. You know, so that's how they, that's how they work. Spielberg's own guy, Peter is his best friend. They call him Peter. He, uh, my housemate, when I was first pitching the work, he was contacted by Peter, Spielberg's best friend. She, she was told, Kirsten was told, you'll have dinner with Spielberg and you'll be the lead in sweet charity in Hollywood if you sleep with me, Peter said. So that's the game. It's, you know, so it's like, it's, 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 and they do it. They do it. It's like the people want the fame and the fortune. So, mm. yeah. Um, you sorry, but when you're speaking, like something sounds like it's rolling around on a table or clicking or something like that. Really? Um, yeah. So, but anyway, um, yeah, I I think you know maybe we can conclude the interview a little bit. Um, you talked a lot about you know you really presented your case well. Do you have a name for the documentary you're putting out yet? We don't. We don't have a name for it assigned yet. The mm -hmm. working title was called um, Inside the Secret Kingdom. Okay. okay. Robertson wrote a book called The Secret Kingdom. And so he's connected to Hollywood and Disney, all that stuff. I got so much more I could show you, but yeah, now they, how they have the connections. But that's why we were thinking the working title was Inside the Secret Kingdom. So the case goes on, right? Like it's still- Oh, it's going to be amazing. Right now, it's, think of it as a tug of war. 
and their feet are slipping, they're falling on themselves, and we're just pulling that rope right back. So that's why it's not really the best time for shills or handlers or naysayers because we've got this on a roll. And you're seeing a lot of actions now with the FBI getting very desperate, CIA, you're seeing Hollywood getting desperate, and the deals keep coming my way. So, you know, right now they're estimating my worth at $1.2 billion, or that was a recent one. So I'm going to see this through. For my last son, I'm going to see it through. And like I said, for other kids too, because there is sex rings that are still operating. I'm being told that by contacts. So more and more handlers and informants are now informing me. It's like it just snowballed the other way. So I'm not going to be stupid with it. I'm going to handle this with a rational approach and be very severe on the handling of it. And I will, I, you'll see me be very short with those that are naysayers or trying to poo-poo it or things like that. I don't have time for them. My son's lives were sacrificed in this, and I don't want to dishonor their memory with people that are idiots. I'm going to see this through and finish it strong, and hopefully this will open the door for others. In our case, you've got all those inserts in that first film, like I said, all those in, like high school, birthday, what are the odds? We said mathematical probabilities. It cannot be lost. And thank you, Wachowskis, for doing it. And if you can get the Wachowskis on our program, that's going to be a real winner. And guaranteed, that will be remembered forever. And I will give you a show. And I'll give you a <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll try to use all my leverage, you know. <laughs> yeah, go for it. I'll be there with bells and whistles. I bet you will. I will. Um, I, I want to leave off with a, with a couple questions. One is... When do you think this whole thing will conclude and do you fear for your life? No, absolutely do not fear for my life at all. I've already had the dealings on, you know, tape dealings. I told you about the cassette rec or the recordings of all this stuff, digital recordings of their calls. So I already know I've talked to the tops. I had a Bob Iger want to talk to me. I've got Mike Lang on tape too, talking to me. So I already know the pulse, what's going on, what my value is according to them, why they did what they did, what I'm worth to them, what they're excited about. So no, I do not fear at all for my life at this point. So I think that my son and I are going to sail right through. Now we're considering, get this word, get this word in the industry. You asked about the industry, assets. We are assets according to them. Star player on the bench is another quote. Star player on the bench so all that happened to my sons and everything was me being benched. That shows you the Hollywood mentality, all about power. And they are brutal, all about being clever. That just backfired in their face. So I do not fear for my life. Was there another part of that question? Uh, I was just asking, when do you think that, that, that there will be a resolution to the, to the whole case? Within two years, this is all going to be resolved. Okay. And what are you doing in the meantime right now? Are you still screenwriting or... Uh, yep, I am. I'm doing the screenplays and I'm doing, I'm, I'm doctoring them. I'm ready. They're ready. And I'm excited. I am very excited about the screenplays I have. And Disney knows that. And it's like, oh my God, Chad, it's like, they have the layers. If the Wachowskis and the suits and all those guys and Joel Silver didn't understand the immortals or the matrix, they didn't understand what they were doing. They don't, they'll never understand this stuff. But audiences will. I wrote because I believe audiences are intelligent when it comes down to it, that we're not a dumb society. And uh, we, can, we can show that. So, yes, I am, I'm writing. I'm doing interviews because that's what they fear most. You do what they fear most. Like my son said, so I'm going to keep doing interviews. I'm going to keep going. I got Sarah West all tomorrow. So I'm going to keep going, keep getting word out. We'll make the documentary. We'll do the case if it's necessary. If they want to play ball, yeah. We'll play ball, but not the venue of their choice anymore with the people they provide. Okay. I just have a, a question. This kind of a, maybe a selfish question, but people, you know, uh, because I've, I have a screen, I'm one of those people that I had an idea for a screenplay sure. and I've been carrying it around in my head for 25 years. I actually wrote, I wrote it out. You know, I bought screenwriting software. I wrote it out. I plotted it. I had the screenwriting books like save the cat and <laughs> You know, yeah. the <laughs> the other screenwriting books that people buy. Right. Um, but I never, you know, I never really completed it or sent it in. But, you know, when this whole pandemic happened in 2020, 2021, it changed the way that people go to the movies. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we don't go to the movies as much. We watch on our big screens at home. Right. So is there still a place for screenwriters to make money at, Yes, it's still, there's no decline. We're, we're considered the top of the pyramid. It's actually the screenwriter that is considered beyond even directors, producers. We're the pinnacle. That was told to me by Terry Berliner, the Disney Broadway director. So we're the top of the peak, but they consider us assets and under their control. 
So you see a silent revolution coming where the artists will own and lead the way. You do not need the producers. They're fat in the middle and they come up with these stupid ideas they want to insert in the screenplays and stuff. And they just want to get their name and be clever in there. And it ruins the work like the Wachowskis ruined the work. And I'd love to for them to come on the air and try to prove me wrong. But the thing is that that's what's going to be the future. You'll see writers have the ability and the tech to, in order to create their own work, produce it, make it everything. And you're going to see great work, great work. Not everything has been done under the sun. That's on a tape from one of the Disney contexts too. And keep in mind this, here's the other thing that's really going to make writers stand out too. When I say 1.2 billion, that's just the work alone. I'm not talking about the tech. iPad, Surrey, Neuralink, it's all on here. All in here and proven to be my tech in the film that propels the story along. Elon Musk was given it because he was also a Hollywood insider. So yeah, I'm, work. I'm, I'm so, glad you brought up Elon Musk. Yeah, he, so, yeah. <laughs> so Elon awesome. Elon Musk is just an insider as well. He's groomed. I mean, look at look at Iron Man two. Remember we said Keanu Reeves was groomed by the suits. Mm -hmm. so, is, so is Elon Musk. Elon Musk appears, Chad, in um, Iron Man 2. What does he do in Iron Man 2? It doesn't propel the story. He's there when Iron Man wants, I want that table, get that table. I'll arrange it. And Scarlet, whatever, arranges getting the table. And then he's walking by and he goes, oh, there's Elon Musk. Hi, hi. It's like Elon Musk is just standing there. He's like, that's Elon Musk. Hey, we'll stop the movie for a plug for Elon Musk because we're going to groom him because he's an inside monkey. And then we'll go. Elon Musk doesn't have a brain at all. I'm telling you, he doesn't even understand the work. Neuralink is all through the original screenplay. You'll see it when the film is made, how it's supposed to be and what it warns you about. Also, there's a lot of bad things about Neuralink and you don't want it. You do not want it. It's so, my impression. I, I agree with you. I completely agree with you. I don't want to be in, uh, you know. No, no. <laughs> That's good. That's giving your whole, not your identity, your mind over. You become I dependent uh, in the screenplay, it says you become dependent on Neuralink. In the original Immortals, you become, it warns you, you become dependent on it. And our character, the Neo character, actually goes a phrase where he's being planted Smith's memories. They even have that blend in there. They do it badly with the pigeons flying, with the shoes walking up, which I have the shoes walking up. So he's given Smith's memories in order to find out what the main building is. And it turns out to be the dome and the cortex building. And so he's given those memories and Trinity is supposed to help him because he's now using the memories of Smith. He's told he has to remember three things he can hold on to. Think of what matters he's told. So he has to lose all his memories because the architect diseased his neural link. He became dependent on it. See the picture? That's in the original work. Wachowski's made a mess of it. Jim so threw away. So you don't think that Elon Musk you know, had created PayPal or I know he invested in Tesla. I don't know. know. It, may, it may have been given it like Zuckerman was given Facebook, but the thing right. is like, you know, what you have is handoffs often to keep it in house. The Wachowskis would claim the backstory is that they were brought by Mel Gibson. How did Mel Gibson discovered failed painters that dropped out of school? Their mom said all they did was create video games that had no body of work. Why would Mel Gibson introduce them to Dean Lorenzo? And why did Dean Lorenzo just wine and dine them? No, these are people brought in that are failures on purpose, groomed to be heroes. And that's part of the being clever. But the public thinks, oh, they're so great. They're not the Brahms, the rocket scientists. You know, what they are is they are actually failed people like Sophia Stewart that is brought in to be in-house, to claim the work in-house that they control. More failed, the better. And then they're puppets. And then but, Andy ends up having to wear a dress. Well, Harrison Ford was just a carpenter. He was actually working, I think, on George Lucas's house. And George Lucas said, yeah. you ever think about, you know, being an actor? And he said, well, I'm a carpenter. And he said, well, I think you should audition for Star Wars. <laughs> what would cause that? What would cause it? And why is Matthew McConaughey picked up at a bar? You want to do acting. So why are these people that weren't really into the acting field? You know, it's like, isn't that interesting? Hollywood looks for those that can control and brand, stamp, trademark, and own like cattle. And what happens is they own them. They make sure they own them. And the parties are a big part of that in order to make sure they don't get out of line. And then they, they sell their souls. They do sell their souls. Do you think that a lot of the celebrities that lost their life at a young age or um, these, you know, suspect deaths that they're part of, maybe they weren't playing ball. And so they were taken out. I believe that's very, very possible. Now there are accidents that happen, 
But in Hollywood, <laughs> look at the films. In the films, they always say things like, his heart gave out. And in real life, they say that. And one that's not funny at all in my mind is George Michael. George Michael, they said his heart gave out around Christmas. They'd like to pick holidays. They went after me on holidays too. Now, this is very important. I sent you a, um, a clip or a still for that is composite actually. And if you go to the last page of this work, the last page of the immortals, I'm going to open it up and show you the final credits. This is driving them crazy. The other side. So here comes the immortals. Get this right. Here's the last page. George Michael praying for time. Now, why is that important? Why did George Michael get killed? What's important about this? Well, George Michael saw the full script for me to submit it in 93. To see the final credits, George Michael praying for time means he's read this. He saw it. He gave his okay to send it in. Now, what's interesting, Chad, is that upsets Warner Brothers and the FBI and the CIA, the cabal, because they want to say that nothing, my work was never written until 1996, they're claiming, because the Wachowskis didn't change to claim the main Matrix until, the name Matrix until 1996. So what they're doing is uh, George Michael was the perfect witness, the perfect witness that he saw a full script in 93, right? And I have the tape of the music. They wanted to take away the music tape that was submitted too. I had copies after the uh, supplied attorney, Anthony Rankin, Tony Rankin, made sure they're destroyed. So what happens is they didn't have me back evidence they got. They just destroyed it and said it never was there. So the tapes, I have the music was George Michael's on that tape and the original music we have. And also Lap of the Gods, uh, pray, uh, Lap of the Gods praying for time. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Lap of the Gods with Arista Records, um, Alan Parsons Project was the opening credits. And so you have Praying for Time with George Michael. So George Michael is the perfect witness to say, no, this work was completed in 1993. I saw the script and gave my okay for it to be submitted. And that's why it was submitted. So they took him out on a holiday and said his heart gave out. So George Michael is a good man, one of the good ones in the industry that was sacrificed for this theft worth over $1.2 billion. Yeah. Well, I certainly hope that this uh, comes to a resolution quickly for you, that you get what you're... You're, you've earned through the years. I mean, what really is coming to you? you they're, oh, I'm looking. I would, I'm going to be the first one to watch that documentary when it comes out. Please, please email me the link. I will. I will stay in touch. I'll stay in touch because I, I was a, great to be on your show. I'm honored to be on here. Uh, naysayers are like this. Yeah, you know, what, I mean, it's too much evidence. I mean, wh who's going to go against, against evidence like this? It's like well, the Batman family and the Fingers family. It was pointed out to me by paparazzi. They said that that only was about a cassette where they kind of said, well, maybe you should deserve some credit. This is like, what are we showing here? So, yeah. Yeah, you, you definitely presented a strong case today on my show. And Tom, tell people if they want to know more about you, where can they find you? They can find me on Twitter right now. I'm also on Instagram. You look up Tom Oldhouse, you can find me there. Also on Facebook, which, you know, yeah. but Facebook, it's, I'm maxed out pretty much on friends on Facebook because people are really spreading the word. They're getting it. They're seeing the evidence. They're using critical thinking. They're not falling for the shills. That's been the last play they can throw, throw the other side can throw. So Facebook, you'll see Tom Althouse. You'll see my last surviving son on my shoulder on Maui. And uh, that's the profile pic. And then um, I've got the writer's page on there too. Tom Althouse writer's page, Facebook, also the Matrix one. But Twitter and Instagram, also, you can find me on that too. And I'm happy to accept them. There's a limit really for that. No, um, you don't have a website? I do. It's funny because it was Hollywood guys, the contacts that told me to use this title. They said, use this title. It's available. And I did. And it's funny now because it's redpillrising.org. So that's going to be changed now. We're making a new site. But Red Pill Rising still, still works. There's old interviews on it, nothing updated with the interviews. But it shows you that uh, information I was talking about. It'll show you stills of the information that was actually in the film. So that's worth that. It also has uh, Aiden's film he made, the short two-minute clip one, which is The Father's Journey, which is really upsetting the industry because you get his view, his eyes on what he's experienced. And that's why Sophia Stewart and the rest are saying, he's not alive, you made him up. Yeah, really? Check out his work on there, The Father's Journey. And uh, yeah, so he'll be part of the documentary too, along with my mom even, and then his main players like James Boyd. So Twitter, Instagram, redpillrising.org, and Facebook. And uh, if anybody wants to email me something, has a certain pertinent email I gave you, 77, the true man 
show, not Truman, but the true man show at gmail.com. And that's because Hollywood Insider said you are the Truman show. So I was like, okay, thanks. Yeah. And I'll, I'll post your links below in the description. So if people want to find you, you can click those links. And if you, the viewers out there have any questions, cause Tom had a lot to say today. I don't know if I was able to, you know, answer everything or you answered everything for the viewers, just drop them in the comment section and maybe in the future, I can have you back on, talk more about. Yeah, let's do a, if you, I'd love that chat. If you can do a, a, um, a call in thing too, I'm happy to answer any questions. Even Shill's calling in fine. I'll answer it. But if you can get Larry and Andy, yeah, you pull your strength. Let's do it. That would be the historic <laughs> moment. I would love to go head to head to discuss, to discuss, I'll behave myself, discuss where these things came from and you watch the reactions. That'd be so telling. Oh my God, that'd be priceless. That watch the dance. Watch the dance. Well, that would be if I can get the watch house keys on. Uh, <laughs> but oh my God, that would be the author's dream. The actual author's dream. It's like Solomon's baby. That puts the baby back together. And <laughs> I would love to hear their answers. I would love to hear their answers. We left it up for audiences. So we were deciding they would, they would could decide. I'm like, I'd love to hear it. Watch that thing, the bound interview with them on YouTube. Uh, yeah. Wachowski's bound. Watch what they sound like. That'd be, that'd be the greatest interview in the world. Well, I, I know that my viewers are going to have questions, so I'm going to compile these questions and then I will email you when I have enough and we can have you back on. But let's do that. Let's answer those questions and, and have a call in session too. Thanks, Chad. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Sure. It's been a pleasure. Nice meeting you, Tom.